see you this morning. We're in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, if you want to look that up. Galatians chapter 2, starting verse 11, going through to the end of the chapter. Interesting story. There's two parts to this message. There is a, a theological, theoretical part to it, and then there is a case study part to it. And this uh, chapter sort of captures both of those elements in balance with one another. How the theory of, theory of it was actually lived out by the man who tells us the story. And I hope that you will do the same as you take the theory and as you take the case study, that you'll apply it to your life in a very relevant way. Ask yourself some questions as we're going through this message in terms of how this applies. Um, for those of you that want to study further into this, if you're intrigued by it, I'll give credit to, um, to the author that I'm borrowing some thoughts from this morning. Um, you will find it in a book entitled How People Change. How People Change. Very, very profound book. Will change your life guaranteed. So if you want to look that up on Amazon, you can get it in Kindle format, digital format, or you can order the book in hard copy. And uh, How People Change is what it's called. Right, Galatians chapter 2 starts with a story, and it reads like this. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, this is Paul writing, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Pause there for a moment. This is our friend Peter. And we all know the story of Peter. Peter is someone who we often speak about because I think somewhere deep on the inside, we know that there is a lot of Peter in us. Peter is the man who denied his Lord three times. And yet despite that denial three times, Peter with his independent, self-willed nature, not taking seriously the warning of Jesus. Jesus looks into his soul. He sees the independence. He knows that the independence, the lack of reliance upon God and upon him as the Savior, he sees this independence and he knows that an independent spirit may look strong on the outside. But when the crunch comes, you will fail. You will fall because you need a strength that supersedes anything humanity has in itself. And so Jesus looking into the soul of Peter, having walked with him, having talked with him for three and a half years, Peter whose heart is in the right place in so many ways, this Peter who came to his Lord's defense when he felt, felt like his Lord was being pessimistic and downhearted, when his Lord was saying that the road ahead leading to the cross was going to be one of, of rejection and of suffering and of shame and of punishment and of false accusation, this Peter is the one who piped up for Jesus and said, never will this happen to you. We've got your back, Jesus. We are your partners. We will make sure that you are never humiliated like that. We will make sure we will come to your rescue. And Jesus turns to him, looks him straight in the face and says, Get behind me, Satan. This Peter, whose heart is in the right place, but doesn't quite get what the kingdom of God is about. This is the Peter who, just as Jesus prophesied on the night of his betrayal, stands there in that room where Jesus is being tried and curses and swears to prove the point that he doesn't know Jesus. The cock crows. Peter remembers the prophecy of Jesus, turns and looks Jesus straight in the face. And the look on Jesus' face, far from being one of judgment and I told you so, the look on Jesus' face of sorrow and forgiveness combined breaks the heart of Peter and he goes from that place to be converted. And what we mean by that is no longer to rely on what he thinks about himself what he thinks are his assets and his strengths, but now to rely entirely and completely upon Jesus because he knows that what is in him is deceptive. What is in him, what is within Peter is deceptive. It looks strong. It feels strong. It, it acts bold, 
but it fails under pressure and test. It is self-preservation. And he throws himself on the mercy of Jesus and he's a changed man. This is the same Peter who Jesus later on after the resurrection calls aside on the beach that day, takes him for a walk. In fact, in front of the others before the walk, he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? How do you answer that? All Peter can say is, yes, I do. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? You know I do. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Three times, three times, three times Peter denies his Lord. Three times in public, just like the denials were public. Three times Jesus in public in the hearing of the other disciples who might be tempted to look down on Peter for what he did. Three times Jesus publicly reinstates the Peter who denied him three times. This is Peter, a changed man reinstated by Jesus to be a leader amongst the disciples and in the New Testament early church. This is the same Peter that we are reading about here who again denies his Lord, who again denies the very truth of the gospel. This is that same Peter. And Paul seeks to restore Peter Paul seeks to undo the ungodly and bad example of Peter. What is it that Peter has done? The story we read tells us very clearly that Peter had forsaken the Jewish way of living. He was no longer holding himself to the Jewish traditions and to the Mosaic law in all its rigors, particularly when he was amongst the Gentiles. They had come to understand the good news of the gospel. They had come to understand what Paul writes about in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. When you have some time, read through that chapter. In Ephesians, Paul goes through and he, he makes the case, he makes the point that Christ has united both parties in one body and has broken down the wall of partition between them. The thing that made me uniquely Jewish, my, my rites, my ceremonies, my sacrificial system, my, my, um, my, my religious holidays, all those things that identified me and shaped me as being uniquely Jewish. He says at the, at the death of Jesus, when that curtain is torn from top to bottom, that whole system implodes on itself because it has reached its fulfillment in Christ. And now the Gentile and the Jew stand on equal footing at the foot of the cross. Therefore, there is is nothing uniquely Jewish that the Gentiles need to adhere to. They don't have to first become Jews in order for Christ to benefit them. They don't first have to become religious um, holiday keepers. They don't first have to become circumcised. They don't first have to subscribe to the Passover and all the other, all the other things that made the Jews the Jews. Jesus benefits anyone who will put their faith directly in him without first having to become something else. And Paul captures us in Ephesians. Peter understands this. But the Jews come to town. The Jews come to town. And Peter shifts from the fear of God to the fear of man. In that moment, what hijacks and rules Peter's heart is no longer that he's living for God and God's glory, come what may, forget the consequences. Suddenly, he's thinking politics. Suddenly, he's thinking friendships. Suddenly, he's desiring to be respected and admired. He's even reasoning evangelistically that if I lose credibility with these people, how will I lead them to Christ? How will I be an example to Christ? He's got all sorts of justifications in his mind, why when the Jews come to town, for just this brief season, for just this brief season, while the Jews are in town, I will go back to living as if I still subscribed to the Jewish way of living. And Paul recognized that if this went unchecked, it would completely undermine the gospel, the idea that out of all the nations of the earth, there is no more dividing line. That the good news of the gospel is that all are brought into the fellowship of Jesus Christ as the head. And if you are in fellowship with Jesus Christ as the head, you must be and can only be connected to his body. It is impossible to be a Christian by yourself. It is impossible to be a Christian off on your own mission. It is impossible to be a Christian that doesn't need 
other Christians. That doesn't need to be in community with other Christians. It is impossible to be that because the head is connected to the body parts. And if you are connected to the head, you are de facto connected to the rest of the body. And Paul understands that what Peter is doing here, as innocent as it seems and as justified as it seems in Peter's mind, perhaps for all the, quote, right reasons in Peter's mind, is it completely, it's like a landmine underneath the fledgling gospel that has just been planted in these people's hearts and minds. It stands to undo all the progress that has been made. And so Paul takes Peter on publicly to deal with the situation. And that verse we read at the end there, he says to Peter, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you then compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? So you're living like the Gentiles, but now by your example and what you're doing, you're in essence saying that the Gentiles must become Jews. But you're living like the Gentiles, but you're telling the Gentiles they need to become like Jews. He says, you've got it all mixed up. We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. We, the Jews, Peter. Paul is speaking about himself and Peter. We who are Jews. You and me, Peter, we have had this debate. We have spoken about this. There was a council at Jerusalem. Peter, we who are Jews understand that our laws can never justify us. We are saved alone by grace in Jesus Christ. He says, we understand this and we have forsaken the Jewish way of living knowing that those things don't merit salvation. We know that we're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. But, but Peter, if while we seek, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found to be sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? What was that? He says, listen, Peter, when you go back to living like a Jew, what you are saying is that what Jesus did isn't sufficient. When you go back to living like a Jew, putting your trust and your dependence in the Jew Jewish nationality with all its ways and things and laws and ways of doing things, you are saying that Christ's sacrifice is great, but it's not sufficient. So we're seeking to be justified in Christ. But at the same time, you're denying that by your example. You're saying we're still sinners and need to do something other than what Christ has done in order to make us right with God. And he says, does that then make Jesus... And accomplish, uh, and accomplish to our sin. You know, he has promised to forgive us and make us right with him. You're coming along and by your example, you're saying what he has done isn't enough. That means that if we trust only in Jesus and what you're saying is true, Peter, that Jesus isn't enough, then he is party to me being found guilty as a sinner because he has said, trust in me and me alone, but he doesn't have the goods to offer. And then he turns it around on Peter and he says, But that's not the case, certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. He says, no, no, no. Peter, it's not that Jesus is insufficient. It's that when you go back to anything other than trust in Jesus Christ, when you go back to your nationality and your way, old ways of doing things, when you revert to trying to earn your salvation, when you go back to that, it is you who condemn yourself because you are taking yourself out of Christ and depending upon yourself. There is pride going on. There is the fear of man in seeking the, the, the recognition and the approbation of other men. You are letting the agendas of other people control how you relate to God. And then he says, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Now, this is a beautiful statement. Sounds kind of weird and theological, but here's what it says. Paul says, let me tell you my testimony, Peter. Here's the deal. I was a meticulous law keeper. I put my trust in those things. I did everything the law told me to do, and then some extra. And let me tell you, the more I read that law, 
the more I studied it, the more dissatisfaction I felt in my soul. The harder I tried, the further I seemed to fall away from the standard. The more I comprehended what the law called me to, the, the, the more I had to strive for something higher than I had striven before, and I just can never get there. The more I read the law, the more I realized I couldn't do it. The more I studied the law, the more I tried to practice the law, the more the sense of lostness grew in me, and I died to the law. I realized I re it was the very law and its teachings and its high morals that actually awakened my conscience to the fact that I cannot do this. I just can't. Have you ever been that in that place in your spiritual journey? It's actually a really good place to be. It feels terrible. It feels like I'm lost. But you're on the edge of salvation because that's where you have to be before you can be saved. You recognize, I cannot, I just can't, God. What? Now, what the devil comes in at that point and does in your mind is he goes, oh, you can't do it. You might as well give up. That's the only thing to do. You know you can't do it. Give up. That's the little angel on your left-hand side, the fallen angel. The angel on the right-hand side is going, yeah, you can't do it. Surrender. Surrender to me. Left hand angel, you can't do it. Give it up. Just go and live your life and die. The right hand angel is going, you can't do it. Give it to me. Surrender to me that you may have salvation. Don't give up. Give over. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the gospel in a sentence. He says, now listen, I have a new identity I have a new identity, my identity. I am no longer shaped by my failings. I am not my, whatever my failing is. I'm not whatever I, my successes are in the world. My identity is rooted in the solid rock of what God has done for me. My, my identity is rooted in my adoption into, into the family of God through the gift of Jesus Christ. I am, whether I am fallen or not, whether I am failing or successful, I am always and at all times a son and a daughter in Christ. That is the thing I anchor my life to, my identity in Christ, because everything in this world can be taken from you in a moment, in a moment. Your identity is in your success of the world, in the job you have, the status you have in the eyes of other, others. All of that can change in a moment. Your identity, you've rooted it in your educational standing. What happens when you lose your mind and you get a little bit of Alzheimer's? What happens then? Where's your identity then? Your, your identity is rooted in you being a mother and a father. What when your children are taken from you by disaster and tragedy? Your identity is rooted in, 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 your, in your family heritage. What happens if you're shamed and you lose connection with your family because you're expelled from your family? If your identity is in anything in this world, it's only at risk of being lost. When your identity is in Christ, it is the rock to which you govern your life, that you tie your life to. It becomes the influence. You now live as a child, as a son, or as a daughter of Jesus Christ. You live that life because that is who you are. You may struggle with alcohol, but you are not an alcoholic. You are a son or daughter of God struggling against alcohol. Do you understand what that means? It means it opens up endless possibility for change and transformation. It, it, it means that Christ lives in me. I am not bound by the potential that education provides or the potential that my birthright provides or the potential that my finances provide or the potential of anything else in this world because all of those things, number one, have a limit and number two, can be snatched away from you beyond your control. When your identity is in Christ, when you realize that, that the cross is not just something that benefits you. He doesn't say, oh, because of the cross, I have certain benefits in my life. He says, I'm going to take it a step further. Not just that Jesus died for me, on my behalf, outside of me, but I am so united to Christ. I, I see myself as so tied up with him, so mixed in with him, that I died in Christ. At the cross, it is my death. It is my judgment. In Jesus is my resurrection. And Him being in heaven, I am already there. The body just has to catch up. 
My identity is so locked in and tied in with who, who God is and what He has done for me. The only thing no one can ever take away from you, the only thing that can take it away is if you choose to deny it and renounce it. And this is what Paul is doing with Peter. He's going back to reasoning the gospel through with him. And he's saying, Peter, you have denied your identity in Christ. You have gone back to what you knew before. You have fixed your locus of identity in Judaism. You're finding your potential only in the estimation of other men. You're not living in trust and faith, but you've taken things back into your own hands. You've denied the very core of the gospel. And you've done so in front of others who are going to get the gospel all confused in their minds now. Because the loudest sermon you will ever preach is the sermon of your example in life. You can undo every sermon of word by the sermon of your life. Or you give every sermon you ever speak with your mouth credibility by the life you live. He says, listen, your identity needs to be rooted in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Every day you live, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly or in vain. He says, I can't go back to anything other than the grace of God and faith in him. I want you to notice that as Paul, between this, this beautiful gospel theory and this case study that's actually being worked out here, I want you to notice three things about what the gospel looks like in action. Number one, it, it calls us to live with personal integrity. What do I mean by personal integrity? I mean that as Christians believing in the grace of Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith, finding our identity in Christ, it means that I will seek an accurate self-knowledge of myself through the Scriptures. This is what Paul is challenging Peter to. Peter, Paul is demonstrating what this theory looks like as he engages with Peter in real life relationships. Let me, let me just, just jump ahead a little bit here and say this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is always, only, and exclusively lived out in real world relationships. Did you get that? The gospel of Jesus Christ is always, only, and exclusively lived out in real world relationships. The gospel is not designed to call you into a little monastery or ivory tower where you can seek your own purity and perfection of character while the rest of the world goes to hell. You are called to live the gospel as a father and as a mother in front of your children. You are called to live the gospel in community with other believers. You are called to live the gospel in relationship with God. In fact, salvation doesn't happen outside of relationship with God. This is eternal life. The gospel of John chapter 17. This is eternal life that they may what? Know the theory of doctrines and beliefs? This is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then Jesus goes on in that same chapter to pray about how his disciples who know the only true God and Jesus Christ live out that relationship. That vertical relationship translates into horizontal relationships with people in this life and in this world. He'd read John chapter 17 sometime again, and you will find Jesus agonizing over what it looks like to live out our relationship with God in a community, in the world. The temptation to pull away from community is the temptation and the call of the enemy to forsake personal integrity. We live with integrity because we seek an honest self-knowledge of ourselves through the scriptures. We live with integrity when the call of the gospel brings us to be honest about our struggles in front of other people. This idea that you've got to have it all together and have a happy face on at church is nonsense. This idea that Christians don't struggle and we don't struggle against sin because somehow you graduate to church when you've overcome the weaknesses of your character is nonsense. 
But we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable with each other. And because I don't let myself be vulnerable with you, you think there's something wrong with you when you feel prompted to be vulnerable about your struggles. So you keep it to yourself, I keep it to myself, and our relationships don't become intimate with each other. That is not the kind of community we're called to as God's disciples. We see Jesus agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he does it in front of his disciples. We see Jesus bearing his heart to his disciples, saying, I am troubled within me now. We see Jesus wrestling with his emotions and with his, with his sufferings in the hearing and is and modeling it in front of his disciples. But somehow we think the evidence of a true community of faith is that the people who come here have it together. That is not the community of faith. That is not the community of faith. In fact, because we subtly believe that, we are easily tempted by the devil when we experience hurt, betrayal, and disappointment. Because false expectations of what makes up the church of my brothers and my sisters, false expectations will lead to a sense of being betrayed. Because I expected you to be different, and now you're just like me, and that's messed up. I didn't expect you to be like me. I came here because I had a problem to get help from all of you. But now I discover you're all looking for help from God just like I'm looking for help from God. And when we live out the gospel and our brokenness and our sin in front of each other, sometimes that means I disappoint you. Oh, no, 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 wait. We, we, we don't say it like that. That means you disappoint me. Right? That is the reality of the community of faith. If you are here this morning and you are relatively new to the church idea, let me just pop that bubble for you right now because it will be less painful in the short run than the disillusionment that comes over time. When you realize that everybody in this room struggles like you do. When you realize that the pastor is preaching today struggles like you. Personal integrity means we seek an accurate self-knowledge of ourselves and it means that we are willing to be open and vulnerable about our struggles in the presence of others because we know that our struggle helps them and their struggle helps us and we carry one another's burdens. And personal integrity means we recognize that change is a community project. What do I mean by that? As a Seventh-day Adventist church, we have spoken for 160-something years about the importance of sanctification. Fancy word for those of you not familiar with that language. Sanctification simply means becoming like Christ, forsaking my sinfulness and my brokenness, and the quest to return back to the image of God in all its fullness. We have spoken about that for 160-something years, as many generations before us, but we have spoken about it too often as an individual quest. And when it is my individual quest, it can work against community. In fact, here's the biblical model. Your change, your transformation, your gospel experience happens in relationship with God and in relationship with other people. What that means is the things that annoy me the most about you are God's ordained means to call me to repentance. Did you get that? You know the things that you go, why do I keep coming to church? You know, it's hard at work. It's sometimes hard in the family. It's hard with other stuff. Church is an optional extra. I don't need this in my life anymore. I'm not coming to church anymore. You know, either church must be good and it must be easy and it must be pleasant like going to watch a movie and my entertainment or else I just don't need it in my life because I've got enough junk in my life. I've got enough problems in my life without all of you. Now listen to me carefully. You have failed your quest of sanctification. Because it's all about learning to love like God loves. To lay down your life like Christ laid down his life. That is the end point of sanctification. You can, you can talk about moral perfection all you want. But at the end of the day... 
You are called to lay down your life for his body like he laid down his life for his body. And when I, when I in my self-righteousness and my indignation, and we call it pain, and we call it suffering, and we call it all sorts of other excuses, but when I in my self-righteousness think, I no longer need to tolerate you, I have failed to be Christ-like. At that moment, while I'm turning my back on you and I'm going goodbye and good riddance, at that moment, I have emulated the devil. You see, I need you and you need me, even the most objectionable elements of our characters. You know why we need each other? We need each other because without those things happening, you wouldn't know what to repent of. You wouldn't know how desperately you need the Savior. That point, let me just say it one more time. That point where you feel like I'm going to give up and work, walk away from this. That point, stop there. Step outside of your body for a moment and go, what is going on here? You analyze that and you'll be talking about the idolatries of the heart. You will be talking about pride and self-sufficiency. You will be talking about the fear of man and disappointment over the opinions of others and the behaviors of others. You will be talking about a whole lot of stuff that is not the worship of God. You and I are called to live with personal integrity and that means recognizing that change or sanctification happens as a community project. We are called to create a climate of grace. In the way that God has dealt with us, with His grace, we are called to create a climate of grace for the lives of others. And what does that mean? Creating a climate of grace means that I will be willing to give forgiveness when you fail against me. Not the first time, the second time, the third time, but the 70 times seven time. A climate of grace means that I am willing to forgive you. I do forgive you and I seek reconciliation. A climate of grace means that I am willing to seek forgiveness. Not just that I know you, not just that I know you, that you sin against me and so I need to forgive you. But if this gospel is true, if my identity is in Christ and Christ has so loved me that he has laid down his life for me and he has forgiven me, then I also ought to forgive others. And I also, in the same way that I know I need to seek forgiveness of God, I need to seek your forgiveness because the gospel and my sin is lived out in the real world of relationships. I don't just sin against God. I sin against you. And sinning against you created in the image of God is always the context in which I sin against God. And therefore seeking forgiveness, not just from God, but humbling myself in front of you creates that climate of grace. And imagine if we all started doing that. Imagine if I was proactive about seeking your forgiveness and you were proactive about seeking my forgiveness. Imagine the kind of community that would form. Because you would feel free to struggle and not have to put on the plastic face, right? You would feel like I can come to church and be the real me. You know how we say that thing when you come into church, praise God, we're all here this morning. We can leave our worries and our cares at the door. Nonsense. God calls you to come to him in the entirety of your being, that's what authentic community looks like. That's what it is to live out your identity in Christ. We are called to move towards people in courageous grace and in truth. What does that mean in practice? It means that I don't just wait for people to, to make right around me. It means I don't just wait for sin to be found out. It means I don't just wait for something to be addressed. It means when I see a brother... A sister, because that's what we are. When I see someone that I love in Christ and whom Christ has loved enough to lay down his life, I move towards that person proactively to seek their healing and their reconciliation to the body, to me, towards God. It means sometimes that I intentionally seek out situations that we would call conflict. I mean, isn't that a strange concept? Because when you come to church, you don't want conflict. 
And when you come to church, again, church is supposed to be that place where everybody's happy and in love with Jesus and in love with one another. So there is no conflict. But that's not what the gospel does. It doesn't, it doesn't come to a people who are perfect. It comes to people who need to grow. And what that means is that there is failing and there is disappointment. And we move towards each other proactively. I come to speak I come to speak to you truth, candidly, filled with grace, because I'm seeking peace and unity and restoration. I seek to serve and to give in tangible ways. I persevere when it's difficult. And as I'm dealing with you, my brothers and my sisters... My reactions to you are controlled more by the agenda of Jesus than by the agenda of my own selfish desires, the expectation of others, or the pressures of the situation. We create a climate of grace amongst us. We live with personal integrity. We move towards one another instead of holding one another at arm's length. And you see Paul doing this with Peter. Peter sins. Peter falls. Peter sets a bad example. In that moment, Peter's heart is hijacked by something other than the love and the grace of God. In that moment, Peter is ruled by a hard idolatry, and it shows itself in relationship to the community. And Paul moves towards him. Did he speak truth? Did he speak it candidly? Yes, he did. But he spoke also graciously. He called Peter to remember his identity in Christ. He called Peter to repentance. He didn't come at Peter to destroy Peter. He didn't come at Peter to strip him of his leadership. He didn't come at Peter to wipe him out in the eyes of others. He moved towards Peter to bring healing and restoration and transformation. He reminds Paul knows that we're tempted to forget. And in our forgetfulness, we substitute the truth of God with some form of unbelief that leads to brokenness in behavior and word and action. And Paul moves towards Peter. He doesn't wait for Peter to come and confess to him. He goes to Peter and he says to Peter, Listen, listen, repent, come back to God. Identify yourself in Christ. Set the record straight. Paul knows the sinfulness in himself. And he knows he can't stand on a pedestal. So he comes alongside Peter to restore him. He's not there just to keep the purity of the church by kicking Peter out. You know, sometimes that's the way we handle discipline, isn't it? We just want to make sure that our little club here is nice and pure and clean. So if somebody comes along and messes up in a really significant way, get rid of them so that we can have our purity and balance again. That's not the goal. Paul comes to Peter, one who has erred significantly as a leader. As a leader. Not as an order, as a leader. And he says, Peter, you need to come back brother. He moves towards him with personal integrity. He creates a climate of grace. And he speaks with courageous truth and grace at the same time. How is it that we so often separate these things out from one another? We're either known for our graciousness, which ends up equaling ignoring all significant issues because we don't like conflict and idolize peace. Or on the other extreme, we are on the side of seeking our selfish purity and judgmentalism and all the rest. We speak the truth, but without seasoned by grace. Paul calls for a community that is so rooted in its identity in Christ that in our daily dealings with one another, we live the gospel. We don't just preach it. We don't just talk it. We don't just theorize about it. In our relationships, we move towards each other with a redeeming intention. Because I love you. Because I want your well-being. 
And not for my selfish agenda or to defend the truth or to defend the church, but to move towards you for your well-being and for all those under your care whom you would have influence over. Your redemption matters to me. I will lay down my life for you. Now, I want you to understand what the implications of this is. It means that the community of faith is not always an easy place to be. It means that sometimes people will come to you and sometimes you will be called upon by God to go to people. It's a place where we don't just get together for combined worship while we live independent lives apart from one another. We are in each other's face. Does that make sense? We are in each other's lives. We are called to love one another. To have our identity in Christ. And if my identity is in Christ. And your identity is in Christ. Then we share the same blood. And what happens to you is not just your business. So who cares? And what happens to me is not just my business. So you stay out of it. What happens to you happens to me. What happens to me happens to you. This is the essence of Christian community. This is the essence of gospel community. And I challenge you this morning. What is your primary identity? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist Christian first and foremost? A follower of Jesus? Or are you something before that? Is there something else that you find your personal identity in? Because if you and I have our personal and our primary identity in the person of Jesus and what he has done for us, that radically transforms the way I live. And it radically transforms the fact that I no longer live as an island, but I live in community. When you hurt me, I am called to repent of the selfishness of my heart that would cause me to abandon you even although I have had injustice done to me. When I am the offending party, I am called to seek your forgiveness and to make right relationships. Let me ask you something. Is there something you need to make right with someone? Oh, I don't just mean from this week. Things that go back months. Things that go back years. Things that go back decades. Who are you? Answer that question right, and it determines the trajectory of your life. Amen. I chose the song as the close. Because I want you to think about these words. You know, we have this tendency and this challenge with us. You know, we get so used to the melody. We love the melody that our minds are thinking about something else while our, while our lips are singing the words which we know from memory. I've chosen this song deliberately. And I want you to think about these words in the light of Galatians chapter 2. What a fellowship. That's what we're called to. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Do you see that identity in Christ? When you're leaning on the everlasting arms, it draws us into fellowship, not just with God, but with others. Let's stand together as we sing this song.
Heavenly Father, perhaps the first thing to say this morning is that we have to acknowledge the ways in which we fail. We fail to be your love. We fail to be your grace. We fail to be your forgiveness and your kindness towards others in our lives. Oh, we rejoice and that's, that's how you treat us. We sing songs about it. We praise your name for it. It is our hope and our salvation that that is how you are towards us. But oh, how we fail to be that to others. I pray for your spirit, Lord. For your spirit that would produce in us the fruits of the spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the, the self-control. I ask you, Jesus, to make us channels of your grace. Channels that enable others to catch a picture of God through their experience with us on a daily basis. That you'd set us free from our pride and from cherishing status, the respect of others. For chasing the very many and varied false standards of what it looks like to experience change and transformation, community. As we read our Bibles, your Spirit would speak to us in a very real way. Have mercy upon us, Father God Almighty. Live out your life within us. Teach us in practice what it means to be adopted, to be sons and daughters of the heavenly King. What does that mean, Lord? What does it mean in the practice of life? In the home, in the church, in the community, in the workplace, on the sports field. Speak to us individually. In Jesus' name, amen.